folks as I toggle back and forth. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us at Secular AZ today. For those joining us, feel free, like I said, to put your name in the chat. Uh, if you're in the webinar or on Facebook, we are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade. Um, we have really great programming. I'm really proud of the programming that we have. Our Friday updates bring people from all over the country and all over the world um, to talk about various topics um, that may not be overtly secular in nature, but there's always a connection. Um, next Friday, we're going to be taking the week off. I will be in Madison, Wisconsin for the Freedom From Religion Foundation. You can see online that uh, Lindsay has put up our events calendar. Mars De La Tour with Humanist Society and Freedom From Religion is also going to be there, and they are going to be live streaming things, I guess, so that should be super fun. But for this event, we are going to be back on 1020, so in two Fridays. Join us for a conversation with Ann Thompson and Christy Chait to discuss the work of Moms Demand Action and recent legislative action in Arizona and beyond. So again, you're not going to want to miss this. We have great programming. If you are interested in getting more involved with our organization, uh, we are looking for volunteers to help with our school board support initiative. I just went to Paradise Valley last night and... Um, it was interesting, folks. I'll be writing up a substack about that one. Um, but it's better because they are no longer, um, you know, letting the um, monkeys run the zoo, I guess you could say. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of a membership drive for our 2023 uh, membership because rates are going to be going up. So if you do renew your membership now, we've got some really cool gifts for you. I don't have any of them here with me today, but we have bumper stickers, tote bags, and travel mugs. But today, I'm really excited. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with Reverend Peter Cook. Uh, he serves at exe as executive director of the New York State Council of Churches, which represents 7,500 congregations across the state of New York. He has received his uh, BA from Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, and an MA in liturgical and historical theology, and an MDIV from Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. Reverend Cook has helped the Council of Churches to advocate for state legislation to improve construction and access to affordable housing, extend a bold welcome to immigrants, enact gun control, address wealth inequality, improve the lives, lives of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, access to health care and passage of progressive state legislation to address the climate crisis. Wow like actually kind of following the teachings of Christ. Uh, amazing. He has worked on public policy to counter various forms of nationalism and fascism in the United States and India and its intersection with violence, including gun violence. He was a voice for gun control in the wake of the Buffalo Top Supermarket Massacre and also worked with many groups in Western, um, I think it's Western New York, to counter protest a Christian nationalist group touring the country. Um, he's a strong advocate for religious freedom and human rights in the United States and both India and Palestine and Israel. He has a keen interest uh, in the biblical and theological underpinnings for interfaith dialogue and cooperation. Whew. Okay. Did I miss anything, Reverend Peter? Oh, you're good. That <laughs> that was very, very generous of you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to just turn it over to you. Um, this is going to be more of a kind of a exchange rather than a yeah. presentation. So for anybody who is here, you are welcome to go ahead and put your questions into the chat or into the Q&A, and I will do my very best. You don't have to worry about it, Reverend Peter. I will uh, monitor the chat so you don't have to, but go ahead. Great. Thank you, everyone. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be with um, good friends from Secular Arizona uh, for this um, session on God and guns. And um, I wanted to just begin with a few opening remarks and uh, and then we'll we'll um, use that as a way to you know open it up for questions and then I'll have some more things to say as we move along. But what I want to begin by saying is that, on May 14th, 2022, a young man, barely 18, 
drove to East Buffalo with the goal of killing as many black people as he could. He researched carefully where there would be a high concentration of African Americans, and he settled on East Buffalo in the Maston district, some three hours from the southern tier, which is very close to the Pennsylvania line. In fact, he was able to obtain an automatic rifle in Pennsylvania because he was not permitted under New York state law to purchase such a firearm here in New York. The shooter actually came the day before to scope out the supermarket and after the fact, some described an encounter with a very disturbed and lost young man. The next day, he uh, loaded up and killed 10 Black citizens in cold blood and injured three others, including one person who took a bullet in his head, but by the grace of God, did not die. For those of us who traveled to Buffalo to offer support to a community in complete shock, we learned that the shooter was well steeped in a long written manifesto, which embraced the idea of replacement theory. Replacement theory received increased currency on right-wing talk shows, including Tucker Carlson, to suggest that the population in the United States of people of color was um, methodically replacing white people. And therefore, steps need to be taken at the voting booth and by implication through violence to stop white people from being replaced. The shooter was on a mission to reduce the black population with guns because he perceived that his white power was slipping away. We should also note that replacement theories also promoted as a way to stop immigrants of color from coming to the United States for fear that they will be a majority which threatens white folks. The zeal to build border walls, close the border and be inhospitable as possible to immigrants is well grounded in replacement theory. And a lot of people will do violent things with guns to protect their power. Indeed, guns are used to intimidate, which is the point. And the guns are there to protect an old hierarchy and keep people of color in their place. <coughs> and it takes on almost a divine quality. <coughs> I'll stop. <laughs> Excuse me. I'll stop there and see if uh, we have some questions. Uh, we there's no questions coming in yet. Um, but I I was just reading something. I don't remember where. I'm sure the article came from Twitter. Like when I was going through my Twitter feed, but it was all about the ramping up right now of anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, I mean, it hasn't always been pleasant, right? Statements about um, immigrants, even though we are a nation of immigrants. Um, and, and just thinking about how these statements then turn into actions, right? You know, these folks who listen nonstop to Tucker Carlson or Glenn Becker, or Matt Walsh or whoever these folks are, or like the, the the chuds of TikTok or whatever their name is, you know, every time that 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 person who who runs that account says anything about you know trans kids in schools or something like that, the next thing you know, there's bomb threats. Many of them may just be 
pranks or whatever, but that it like that there doesn't seem to be any accountability for these these this ramping up of violent rhetoric. There's no accountability for the folks who say it, whether it's this person who runs the chuds, chuds of TikTok page or or it's the former president of the United States. So I don't really have a question there, but it's more of a statement that, you know, there's no accountability for, for people who say these things, who promote things like the replacement theory. And then when we do see somebody who actually cites <laughs> and watches Tucker Carlson and and uses his very own words, there's nothing we can do to hold those folks accountable who spread those things. Again, more of an observation, not really a question. Um, Samantha is saying, family and friends of those shot and killed say they loved them and missed them, but apparently it's God's will and they seem to just accept it. I don't know if that's the case with everybody. Uh, Samantha, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, Reverend Cook. And make sure you unmute yourself, Reverend. I can tell you that for the people who lost loved ones in Buffalo, you will not hear from them um, that this was God's will. And um, they are 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 still in just complete trauma about you know what happened and the loss and <laughs> and it's not just them but it's the whole community which you know it just suffers from a a massive amount of post traumatic stress and also a feeling of um, of of being neglected economically and socially. Um, East Buffalo often did not get the kind of uh, investment in that that community that it deserved. Um, some of that was really due to redlining and to um, white exodus and um, and there was just a lack of investment. And somehow this shooting just kind of reinforced for people the sense that East Buffalo was kind of an afterthought. So I don't know that people thought this was God's will. I think people are working through a lot of righteous anger incredible grief, but also an incredible resolve to work together to try to improve their community uh, and to offer hope to people of all ages in that community. And I think, honestly, the only thing that does inspire unmuted. any... I am unmuted. Can you not hear me? I can hear you now, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't before. I'm sorry. Um, what I was going to say is like that one of the good things, I mean, it's even weird to say that there could be anything good that comes out of this because like these things shouldn't happen in the first place. Right. But, but, you know, the, the, the kids from um, uh, the stone, what is it? Mar Stonewood. Um, uh, Stoneman, uh, the the high school. Marjorie Stoneman High yeah, School. Yeah, the one in Florida. Florida. Again, there's Florida. so many mass shootings, it's hard to keep track of. Um, but the activism coming from those young people, uh, also, you know, seeing the parents from Sandy Hook and the whole Sandy Hook promise. And, mm -hmm. you know, at the very least, what I see inspires hope because I see a lot of people coming together who probably actually would have never been quite as involved uh, 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 in in local politics or or changing legislation or legislators. So at least that has come out of it. And then you know, seeing also this generation show up, um, whether it was in Tennessee or the various other places that you know, mostly young people I'm seeing have shown up to try to stop this. Um, 
there's there's going it, we've reached a tipping point i feel like and if as more and more of these millennials and gen z population start to run for office uh, I, I i'm inspired by the kinds of positive progressive changes that they'll bring again yeah. more of a comment <laughs> yeah well I, I do think that's true and i do think that again just going back to east buffalo that there is a lot of resilience and desire to, to try to you know make that community a more livable place <clears throat> um <laughs> but we still have residents a year and a half later who are really reluctant to go back into the top supermarket even though it was rebuilt and they put all this new stuff in where they just they can't they just can't go and um so it it takes a long time i also think that um that the black community has had some very interesting responses to the white community in the wake of this shooting and uh, one of them was i was at a african-american uh clergy uh gathering shortly after the shooting you know and i was this nice white guy from albany who came trying to you know be helpful and i brought a few people with me and uh the pastor was of course you know pleased that i would come and take an interest in him but when i asked him what he thought we could do to be helpful <coughs> we'll start love to say you know, it's nice that you're here, but what I need you to do is go back to your white churches and your white communities and have a pretty deep conversation about why this racism exists in the first place and what kinds of <clears throat> conversations and policies do we engage in that create kind of a petri dish for something like that shooter to show up uh, in Buffalo. <coughs> and I gotta say, um, that made a real impression on me. Um, you know, and it was really a challenge to say to the faith community um, in our churches, when, you know, we say, well, you know, we don't want to be too political. Actually, we don't want to be political at all. We can't talk about race. We can't talk about the, you know, the snarky things that people say at coffee hour. And, you know, at Thanksgiving, we can't take on Uncle Joe for, you know, saying all kinds of racist things and parroting, you know, Tucker Carlson lines. and where is the conversation with um, <clears throat> Christians and Bible study <clears throat> about the racist underpinnings of biblical interpretation? So that was kind of his shot at us, um, to use a not-so-helpful metaphor, but well, and it's, um, you know, I can go ahead and say it, everything is connected to education. I mean, my background is in education, so I'll, you know, I'm always trying to find connections, but this is it, right? You know, all of the, I, I, one of the things that we do with Secular AZ is we monitor what's going on in our local school boards. We have a lot of them here in Arizona. And, you know, I, I, I have a Google um uh, Google alert set to things like CRT, um, SEL, you know, all of these whistle words that that these angry parents are now showing up. So like, this is all connected. You know, the fact that the replacement theory is, is 
in some circles seen as uh, you know a, a valid theory um, just goes to show that we need strong public education. We need to have difficult conversations about our background and our history. And I do have a question here from Emily, uh, Reverend Cook, if you're ready for it. Um, Emily says, what would you say to those that don't support gun reform because they have a God-given right to protect their family with a gun? And just make sure you unmute yourself. Um, you have a God-given right to have a gun to protect yourself. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack in that statement. Um, I'm going to try to answer it indirectly. Um, and first of all, to say that in the United States, the Second Amendment really was passed as a form of social control over Black people. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, And, you know, you had, excuse me, still I'm um, fighting a bit of a cough here. Um. It's really a form of, of social control. <clears throat> and white people would say that they had a God-given right to have a gun, but black people did not. And furthermore, your God-given right to have a gun was a way for you to maintain <laughs> your power and um, and to maintain indeed a whole social system of hierarchy which accorded rights to white people at the expense of black people. Linda has a comment here and she says, I recently read now one person in 12 has an automatic weapon in the United States. I don't know if you know your statistics, Reverend Cook, uh, but that would not at all shock me if one in 12 has an automatic weapon. Um, let's see, there's another comment here from RJ. March for Our Lives and Students Demand Action are our youth advocates for gun violence prevention. They march, they advocate, and they vote. The USA has the history of killing our BIPOC community members, born here or not, through different means. And we say, for those who believe that it's God's will, that we fight the violence from external and internal forces. Again, more of a comment. Um, let's see. Dawn says, when politicians say we shouldn't pol politicize our problems. That tells me these politicians don't think it's their job to solve our problems, indeed. Um, let's see. Uh, and Mars points out, look at who owns the guns. What are their political affiliations and their faith beliefs? So I don't know if you can speak to that, uh, Reverend Cook, you know, this connection between the extremist, you know, kind of, I guess we could call them the freedom caucus arm, like to go to the far right, and their obsession with guns. What's your take on that? And make sure you unmute yourself. Well, um, 
I, I can't help through those questions to think about January 6th and what gave rise to that. And January 6th <coughs> really drank from the American waters of fascism, which um, really looks at democracy as a threat. <coughs> Free, you know, and um, they often uh, take a lot of solace in embodying their hope in a strong man. In this case, <clears throat> that's Donald Trump. And when that strong man is perceived to be vulnerable or in peril in some way, <clears throat> the whole system becomes in peril as well. And for people who are really steeped in that and schooled in that, the, um, or steeped in that and schooled in that, it didn't take much to imagine a January 6th. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm gonna go through, well, <laughs> poor Reverend Cook, he's clearly recovering from something that is very uncomfortable and nasty. So we're going to give him time to be able to, <laughs> but I'll go ahead and try to read some of these comments here. So let's see what we've got. Um, Matt, perhaps there's a source you can turn. Oh, we're talking about who has guns. So Lindsay posted Republicans and Republican leaning independents are more than twice as likely as Democrats and Democratic leaners to say that they personally own a gun. 45% versus 20. 40% of men say that they own a gun compared with 25% of women. 8% of white Americans own a gun compared with smaller shares of black Hispanic and Asians. I'm confused by that one though, because the numbers are different. Um, Linda says the amount of weapons it adds up, it, up to is one. I'm guessing this is 12 weapons per one person in the United States, but I'm not sure. About four in 10 US adults say they live in a household with a gun, including 32% who say they personally own one. Um, and then there's a question, is this a discussion as to why shootings don't happen because of religion? Religion? I may have missed it at the beginning. No, I don't think that that is the discussion that we're having today to say that um, shootings don't happen because of religion. We're just kind of talking about the connection uh, between guns and God here in the United States. Diane Post says, I heard a guy on Fox say that Trump was the chosen one from God to return to earth and straighten us up. How does a, relig a religious person respond to this nonsense? Now, there's a good question for you, Reverend Cook. Um, do you, how do you respond when people say that, you know, Trump is the chosen one, that he's their Messiah? Um, well, as a Christian, um, there is <laughs> only one Messiah, and it's not Donald Trump. And, um, you know, it it kind of ties into a millennialist kind of theology that suggests that, you know, Christ will come back on back to earth and, <clears throat> um, you know, and sort of transform society to, you know, separate the chosen people from the unchosen people. And sometimes people will try to personify that vision in a some kind of a political figure like Trump. Um, and, but my goodness, I mean, what an incredibly flawed person to hold up to this. I mean, I don't, 
really think that he cares about Christianity. Um, I think he uses Christianity as a political tool to pander to a base. But there's nothing about <laughs> Christianity that he has really internalized into his personal or corporate life. But again, you know, kind of going back to this fascist image of the strong man, <clears throat> that can start to take on almost divine like qualities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, of a, of a savior, even <clears throat> um, a God chosen savior who will come back to um, sort out the problems on earth and uh, but in a way come back to reinforce um, a very patriarchal hierarchical um, social order um, so, I mean, I think all of us just grimace when we go down the highway in some parts of our country and see Trump, you know, in sort of this, in these messianic kinds of terms. It just, uh, it's such a disconnect. I, you know, that's something that I think about all the time, you know, the, the, the ability of people to just disregard. I mean, it's been happening my whole life. So, you know, to give you some background about myself, I was never really raised um, in any kind of religion. My parents were essentially agnostic, I guess. My mom was raised as a Catholic. Um, but, but when it came time to make decisions about what faith I was going to be, both my parents just kind of said, you figure that out on your own. Okay. Um, and now I guess I would consider myself a humanist atheist for lack of a better description, but the thing that always has confused me, and now I see it more and more and more, like there's always been kind of a disconnect, right, with like evangelicals to be able to say, oh, well, I only follow like Leviticus, or, <laughs> you know, I really like Deuteronomy, but some of these other you know, scripture, I'm not really a fan of them, and so I just in, in your experience, being a man of faith for your entire life, you know, how do you explain that kind of disconnect about, you know, the, the actual teachings of Christ and, and the behaviors of his followers and their willingness to be able to not only, it, it seems like they're rejecting the teachings of Christ or even saying, no, 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 that's not what he really did. How would you explain that? And make sure you unmute yourself. If you believe that the Bible is the um, um, the inspired word of God and it is in no way in error, um, you are setting yourself up for a massive amount of hypocrisy. And um, the correct way in which we approach the Bible is that it's a God-inspired work which was written by many fallible human beings who are trying to work out what God means in their lives and in their community. And it's a story, too, of all the struggles that went into that communal and personal life and the contradictions. And the, what we do when we read the Bible is we we live into that story. And... Um, really wrestle with God. The Bible is not a textbook. It is not a cookbook. It is um, a, a series of, of stories 
um, historically grounded of people really trying to sort through their struggles, but it has a certain divinity to it because it honors the struggles that we have in our own lives and gives us a place where we can have that conversation. So a lot of times the Bible, however, gets turned into an idol. You know, when Donald Trump stood up in front of that church in Washington, D.C., um, to somehow <laughs> to somehow, um, you know, really diss um, people protesting under Black Lives Matter. You know, he held up the Bible. By the way, he held it upside down, which was a little funny. Um, and really tried to use it kind of as a a prop for some kind of control, um, which is such an abuse of, of the text and <clears throat> profoundly annoying to the pastor of the church sure. who felt that their name and their church was being used to push this very narrow biblical interpretation. So, I just think we have to be careful about um, while we say that the Bible is the word of God, it is not God. It points us to God. And in the same way, if that's our basic outlook about the Bible, it becomes a way for us to critique a lot of false idols, including the worship of guns in its proper sense. And we also need to know that each one of us in approaching the Bible has a certain set of assumptions. We call this a hermeneutic. What are the assumptions that we bring to the reading of the text which will lead us to amplify some texts and give less weight to other texts as we try to put forward an overall theological arch, which for me is really about love and about justice and about human beings trying to figure out love and justice to acknowledge suffering on the cross, but also the hope that we find in the resurrection that no trial or tribulation, nothing in all creation can ever separate us from the love of God. So, you know, that's kind of the, <clears throat> the frame, my hermeneutic that I bring to the reading of the text, and it allows me to deal with the many contradictions that I find there. But if your hermeneutic is one that the Bible is kind of a, a tool to use verses as a way to maintain a hierarchy or a certain social order, you're going to amplify things in the text that are going to reinforce that hermeneutic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So there's a question um, here. Uh, how did liberation theology morph into the prosperity gospel? Not really related to guns as much, but still, that's a great question. Um. Okay, so the prosperity gospel, um, you know, sometimes has had its attraction in in some um, poor communities or some communities in uh, communities overseas, like in Africa or in um, in certain parts of the United States where somehow if you 
you know, if you give money and you sacrifice and you do these faithful things that prosperity will come to you. And it is a form of hope, right? Um, I think it's a false hope. And it often is used as a theology to line the pockets of the preacher who pushes this. Um, but it, some might interpret that for uh, as a form of liberation for having to struggle materially their whole life. And if you could trust in some way that if you do, do certain things, that abundance will come to you, that does have a, a liberating quality to it. But that's very different than liberation theology, which, that, which really says that <clears throat> God actively wills uh, people to improve their community in their lives through struggle and through liberation and to counter powers and principalities that discriminate against people and uh, you know reinforce a really um, bad economic situation and to really challenge those power structures. And um, if you do that, that if you look at like say the Exodus passage or you know any number of passages of Jesus's you know liberating kinds of works to you know replace replace people from their bondage and to you know stand up to people who worship money more than God um, that if you embrace this that there's a hope in the resurrection and there's the promise of of redemption and it's part of the holy work in which we're engaged the prosperity gospel doesn't take seriously people's oppression or the structures that people are under that lead them to be seduced into this prosperity gospel in the first place yeah i have a sister who's uh big believer and that if she just prays hard enough that you know uh, big cartoon bags full of money are just going to drop right into her lap um and interestingly enough like it doesn't seem like the church that she attends asks her to do anything outside of herself um you know like perhaps maybe feeding the unhoused or, or uh, you know, doing something that would actually improve her neighborhood, but they definitely ask her constantly to help them improve the inside of their church. And so she really believes that that tithing is going to help her not in the next life, but really in this one. Um, and, and she's thinking not of, you know, she thinks of herself as, as a millionaire someday. That's what's going to happen to her someday because she believes in it long uh, enough. Um, let's see. Here's one. Uh, Dale says, as explained to me by an evangelical neighbor, Trump is not messianic, but rather a vessel of God by which God's will can be fulfilled. The Old Testament is filled with stories of evil characters being used by God to fulfill an end. <laughs> and then Mars said, lots of killing in the Bible. There definitely is. Um, yeah, uh, Mars, I don't see much good in Christianity, colonialism, American nationalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and xenophobia. Um, unfortunately, that is what I think many of us see. Um, so in light of all that, I mean, how, how do you, Reverend Cook, like maintain your, your faith and, and, you know, how do you how do you try to put forward the message of all the good? Oh, and you're muted. You know, I um I spent a lot of time working on the issue of nationalism. Nationalism is the idea that a state 
adopts one religion as a way to oppress people of other religions or no religion. In the United States, we have Christian nationalism, which tries to reinforce this kind of hierarchy of, uh, in, in a certain sense, you know, when the people go around and say, oh, well, you know, we're a Christian nation. Well, no, we're really not um, a Christian nation. In our best sense, we're a nation that values the diversity of religion. And uh, that's why we have separation of church and state. <laughs> And um, I come out of the United Church of Christ and the Congregationalist tradition, you know, and back in the day um, in Massachusetts, you had these uh, uh, churches that basically were paid for by taxpayer dollars. <clears throat> we didn't have um, individual giving. <clears throat> and... Um, there, it really was a state, a state church, and uh, and if you were Baptist, God help you, you were sent off to the wilds of Rhode Island, <laughs> and you were left to fend for yourself uh, because you didn't get any tax money, <clears throat> um, and so, but a, a lot of Congregationalists and so on really came to see that this kind of nationalism really distorted religion. It distorted our faith. It took us farther away from our faith, which is why we have the separation of church and state. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a fierce defender of separation of church and state because I think that people of any faith have the right to practice their faith without fear of the government turning into the master theologian um, <clears throat> for that faith. Um, the government's good at many things. Theology is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, usually nationalism also means <clears throat> that its adoption of one faith ends up distorting that faith. And it really is faith is really used as a way to prop up political power <clears throat> and religion is kind of used as a pretext to do that. So for instance, in uh, India, which is another area I work, um, we have what's called Hindu nationalism or Hindutva, <clears throat> which basically is on a quest, a fascist quest to create a Hindu nationalist state where if you're Christian or Muslim or Sikh or Dalit or um, any other religion other than Hindu, uh, you're discriminated against. <clears throat> Your churches could get burned down. You could be denied citizenship. You could be, if you're a journalist critical of the state, you could find yourself arrested as what just happened this <laughs> last week. If you're a visitor, a Christian visitor to India, you could be uh, detained or incarcerated, <clears throat> uh, which actually happened to me, um, you know, for being Christian to show up there. And what's so shocking about this is that Hindutva and white supremacy are kind of kissing cousins. They're both premised on the idea of control <clears throat> and the twisting of religion to um, maintain power over and against everybody else. Um, so how do I live with that as a person of faith? Well, <clears throat> um, I don't regard those things as central to my faith. I think that my faith is what helps me critique those things and point to the Lord of life, to 
to a Christ that uh, is welcoming and inclusive and is not on some kind of quest to uh, convert somebody into his own image, um, but that we find the Christ through the honoring of diversity and the love of others. <clears throat> um, and that is fundamentally at odds with the nationalist project. Mm -hmm. I know that you were um, gonna uh, talk a little bit about uh, what happened uh, in was it Nashville, Tennessee? Again, the, the 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 school shootings and the mass shootings all kind of run together, but I think it was Nashville. So you're gonna um, talk a little bit about that. Um, and you're muted. So this is a little. <clears throat> amusing not amusing but <clears throat> from time to time tennessee tries to make the bible the state book you know and every time they do that some preacher with half a brain stands up and says that if you make the bible in tennessee the state book you're going to embarrass yourself because inevitably you're going to fall short of what that what that Bible says. Um, but they keep kind of trying to resurrect this notion of you know the Bible's a state book and that. Um, and you know, and just lots of religious language and pretense to repress people and suppress people. So what happens when you have a shooter go in to a white Christian school and massacre three white <laughs> children and three white faculty members? And you have two black legislators who um, stand up, to speak out against the idolatry of gun violence. And when they do that, and one of them, by the way, Justin Jones is a, um, a Vanderbilt Divinity School student, uh, which is kind of interesting. <clears throat> when you do that, they brought out all the religious language and high-flying biblical imagery they could think of to justify their expulsion for speaking out against the idolatry of gun violence. And um, so I think Nashville, as the rest of the country, um, finds itself in this really odd space right where where the, the the language of the bible and of faith really runs up against live reality and how it is that we are to be in community with one another sorry i had to find my own unmute button that time um well, it is 1254 and I want to honor everybody's time. Um, I appreciate everybody who uh, came today. I appreciate you. Uh, and sometimes, uh, Reverend Cook, these conversations are a little bit hopeless. Uh, um, and so I wonder what uh, gives you hope, um, you know, in these times where it seems we're more divided than ever. It seems that up is down, black is white, cats and dogs living together, anarchy, all that kind of stuff. Is there is there something that, that gives you hope every day as you continue to do your work to combat the uh, national epidemic of gun violence? Well, the cats and dogs and the chaos has been with us since the beginning of time. You know, if you go back to the early church and 
look at the intense fights that took place there, you know, the disputes that took place or, you know, the battles that we were under during the time of slavery and into reconstruction. And, um, you know, we're, <clears throat> as a democracy, we're always living with a, a level of chaos. <clears throat> um, but I, 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 I guess I, I do believe in progress. I do believe in a, a hope that we find with God, a, a, a future that we can't always imagine on our own. Faith is the thing that we need to help imagine that there is a, a truth out there, a, a hope that we can't visualize, but we trust is there and is true and is real. And all along the way, <clears throat> we find these marvelous stories of connection, of community, of <clears throat> uh, hope. Um, you know, sometimes there are <clears throat> great political things that that happen when all seems lost. I know that, for instance, in Oregon, they managed to pass a pretty substantial gun control law, um, even though, uh, you know, Oregon's a pretty independent-minded state with a lot of gun owners, and yet somehow they did that. And, um, and, you know, in Kansas, for instance, <clears throat> around the, the issue of abortion to, you know, really, you know, Kansas voters stood up and they said, you know, we, we really do need to protect a woman's right to choose. And this is Kansas, you know, this isn't some progressive, <laughs> you know, blue state and living in a progressive blue state, sometimes I find out that sometimes there are some things that aren't so progressive and not so blue. Uh, and yet I, I, I also find a lot of hope, you know, being with people every day who do cool things. And speaking of being with a lot of people every day that do cool things. That is uh, my Friday. I love being able to come on here on Fridays at noon and to be able to see so many familiar and engaged people. I mean, we've got a state representative here with us today. Um, we have Rivko Knox here today who actually ran against Sandra Day O'Connor back in the day. Um, we have a really good group of people. We have the you know, Phoenix Atheists Helping the Homeless, who who also work to help our unhoused neighbors. And we've got this fantastic group of young people known as Generation Z or the millennials or whatever they are that give me hope every single day because they are, I mean, we even had a, a locally elected um, school board member, one of the youngest elected officials in the state of Arizona who just showed up at Kevin McCarthy's office to protest uh, and demand climate action now. So like the hope I have is with all of you who come every single Friday, who support the work that we do. My hope comes with you, Reverend Cook. I appreciate the work that you do. Um, you know, we talk about this a lot where, uh, you know, some of our greatest allies are people of faith. And we have uh, an elected state legislature state legislator here who's an ordained presbyterian minister her name's stephanie stall hamilton and she's fantastic and we have many people like that so you give me hope the people who come here on fridays give me hope and right now here in arizona the weather is also giving me hope because finally i feel like <laughs> i don't have to just walk outside and and just sweat so there's that um, but thank you, Reverend Cook, for coming to join us today. I appreciate you, especially coming. I can tell that you're sick. I hope that you feel better soon. I'm um, sorry for my cough. I'm getting there. I hope I didn't mess up your podcast too much here. But Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. And it's a really important topic. And we're just grateful that there are people like you who do that kind of work. So I hope you have a great weekend. And I hope everybody else does, too.
Great. Thank you for this honor. So sure. thank you so much. Bye, mm -hmm. everybody.